Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode of Aesthetics and Wellness by Dr. Yustra. On our podcast today, we are talking all things chin, why we do chin augmentation, why someone would want to have it done, what you might present with, the features that you might be suffering with like dry mouth or even drooling at night, how it's relevant, the differences between surgical and non-surgical treatments and what type of practitioner, what type of treatment would best suit you to keep you away from looking fake because the idea of what we do is look good, not look done. Hope you enjoy. Welcome Sophie to today's episode. So today we're talking all things chin augmentation. We are. We are probably one of those popular treatments in clinic, I think. I think one of the treatments that we do a lot in combination with yeah. profile balancing, non-surgical rhinoplasty, facial yeah. harmonization, you know, like we often talk about the most popular treatment, but I, I feel like they're all really popular they because... Are. I think I feel like it's the underdog. It's the one that people maybe don't realise they need. Yes. It's like the well underdog said. of treatments. People come in thinking, I want my nose and my lips doing, or I want my nose or, or my lip, whatever it may be. And then actually the chin solves all the problems. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And that's um, really well said. I think the human mind is programmed to recognise features that stick out. Yeah. People don't really recognise or are aware of they're recessive features. They're aware of their prognathic features. So yeah. they're sticky outy features, particularly their nose. Yeah. So definitely by far the most popular treatment is non-surgical rhinoplasty in our clinic. I think we're like a, a hub for that yeah. across the country. But what I often see is that patients come in and say, I hate my nose or my nose is too big for my face. And actually their nose isn't the issue. Yeah. It's that their chin is slightly small and we never treat the face or or, or the, fa- the features in isolation. I always say to my patients, you're not a walking, talking nose. So I can't just look at your nose and, and stick filler in there. I've got to make sure that the treatment that I do suits your face, yeah. optimizes your face, balances yeah. your face. So you're right. It's the underdog. the underdog. So what is chin augmentation for those who don't know? And how does it differ between a surgical chin augmentation? Because it is available non-surgically and surgically. Great question. So uh, chin augmentation, also known as genioplasty or liquid yes. genioplasty, is augmentation of the compartment of the chin. Okay. And when I talk about the compartment of the chin, this area, the chin area, has boundaries. Mm-hmm. The boundary being the lower lip. Yeah. This uh, ligament that sits over here called your mandibular ligament. Okay. And then the lower border of the mandible or the jaw or the chin. And... Sometimes we are, we're all different and some patients when they are born have a congenitally underdeveloped chin complex. So the okay. area, the mandible, the whole lower jaw or the chin complex is underdeveloped relative to the rest of their face. Okay. And this is really, really common in patients who have or who develop congenitally as well a bump on their nose or lack of support in their nose. We see this in combination quite frequently, Mm. which is why, as you said, it's the underdog because patients come in and they say, I really hate my nose and I feel my nose big for my face. And I look and I, and when I do my assessments and my measurements, categorically, their nose is not the issue. Actually, it's the fact that their chin is underdeveloped. And I say, if you, if I took that, if I took your nose, Sophie, and I put it on my one-year-old baby boy, it would look big on his yeah. face. But I put, if I took your nose, same nose, and I put it on my son, it would look small. So the perception of the size of the nose or any feature is relative to the rest of the face. Yeah. So if the chin is underdeveloped, I'm, I'm talking in particular reference on the, on the side profile, yeah. then the nose is going to look overdeveloped. It's mm-hmm. going to look bigger. If you bring the chin out surgically or non-surgically, so you balance it and you put it into a more ideal position, immediately the nose will look smaller. So what we're doing non-surgically is we're using soft tissue fillers, also known as dermal fillers. Dermal fillers come in various shapes and sizes, Mm -hmm. various different densities, thicknesses. And when we are augmenting the chin, we tend to augment deep, i.e. we place the filler, which is a, a hyaluronic acid gel usually. Hyaluronic acid is a sugar molecule known as a polysaccharide, actually naturally present in your tissues. We place this gel deep onto the deepest layer of the face known as the bone. Yeah. And that helps to support and emulate bone because what it is really the issue is that you don't have enough bone support there. The okay. bone is underdeveloped. And if the bone is underdeveloped, then everything that attaches and sits on top 
doesn't have the support that it needs. The muscle doesn't have the support that it needs. And the tissues are sitting further back. So if you have a weak chin, all of the soft tissues don't have the support that they need, including the double chin okay. area. We call this the submentum area. So often I find that patients who have a weak chin or an underdeveloped chin come in and say, I hate my double chin, or I've got like, I've got this double chin. And actually they don't need to go and stick any anything in there. They don't need to get rid of it. What they need to do is support the chin the, the skin mm -hmm. will then pull forward and it will give a much more defined jawline. Okay. So chin augmentation is used to augment and support the soft tissues, mm -hmm. correct an underdeveloped chin um, from a bony structure and improve the jawline and the entire supporting area. Surgically, this mm -hmm. can be done and surgically can be done in two ways. And this was my former life. I used to, you know, my training was in head and neck surgery something we call maxillofacial surgery. And when patients would attend the hospital with an underdeveloped chin, what we would do is we would break the jaw and advance it. It's called mandibular advancement. And yeah. it's quite an involved, high-risk, painful procedure that yields amazing aesthetic outcomes, but huge amounts of physical mental trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a way that we used to pr project the chin. Yeah. Another way is placing an implant. Okay. So you, surgically, we would create a cut in the lower lip, in, inside the mouth, okay. in what we call the buccal sulcus, so underneath the gum. Yeah. Open up that area, expose the bone, and place an implant, either a silicone implant or um, something that would, would essentially not react to the body. And then close that up, and that remains in, pla in place by placing um, screws in. Mm -hmm. And that's another way of having a chin augmentation. And I've seen a lot of patients who've had surgical uh, chin augmentation using an implant, but unfortunately haven't yielded the ideal outcome mm -hmm. because as we age, remember that the bone will continue to resorb. That's just part of the aging process. Nobody escapes it. Even if you're the king and queen, you're still going to get resorption or shrinkage of the bone. So as that bone shrinks, yeah you're going to start to get sagging of the jawline. Okay. You're going to have less definition of the of the jawline. The chin is going to come in. The muscle will, will rotate upwards. The double chin will start to become more obvious. And then they come in and they want help. But if you've had a silicone implant, really important to go and see an experienced aesthetic pr uh, professional because what you never want to do is place filler on top of and directly on top of an implant because of the risk of infection and necrosis. That's something important to understand. So both have their place, both yeah. have valid treatment options. A non-surgical genioplasty, and the reason why we call it genio, genion, the genion is the chin okay. in, in medical terms. Plasty is to change. So a genioplasty can be done with filler or surgically. Of course, with filler, there is much less cost, yeah. much less downtime and it's accessible to most people. Whereas a surgical genioplasty is very involved, has a lot of downtime, complex procedure, high risk, high cost. Doesn't mean it doesn't have its place, of course it does, but these are the differences. And that is why a genio, you know, we do so many genioplasties. And again, I think the other reason why we do a lot is because patients, when they come to see us as facial aesthetic experts, part of that expertise is in facial assessment and artistry. And I, I often say you can teach a monkey to inject. It's not just the injecting. If my patient comes and says to me, can I have my lips done? But actually doing their lips is going to make them look like a duck. Then my answer is maybe not. And the reason, and often if they have an underdeveloped chin and they want lip filler, I say to them, why do you want lip filler? because my lips are small or because they, they feel like it will hide their underdeveloped chin. Okay. They're trying to mask it. They're trying to take attention away from it. But if you place lip filler in a patient who has a weak chin, they're going to look like Marge Simpson. Their lips are going to project and it's not a good look. Yeah. The chin is the pedestal upon which the lips rest. So the chin is very important when it comes to facial profile, balancing facial harmonization. The chin point is the first point that you want to make sure is in the right position everything else follows then. Immediately the nose looks smaller, immediately the patient can carry a lip, a bigger lip. But if their lips are projecting in front mm -hmm. of their chin, it's a it's a no, it's, yeah. not, it's not a good look. It will detract from your beauty, not add on to your beauty. So why we do a lot of genioplasties is for facial profile balancing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And is a chin augmentation suitable for men and women? Because I know we've talked a lot about sort of patients coming wanting bigger lips, which is typically what 
our female patients say. So is it suitable for... It's a very com common procedure in men. I know you're asking this because we have a lot of male patients. It's a very common procedure in men and absolutely men can have it. It's really important to understand the concept of facial feminization and facial masculinization. Yeah. The way that you approach a male face when you're trying to masculinize is very different to how you approach a female face when you want to feminize. Ideally, female, when you think about feminine features, you're thinking high cheekbones, narrow jaw, larger lips a tapered chin point. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about a masculine face, you're thinking strong, wide jaw. Yeah. You don't want these big apples to the cheeks and you're not looking for big pouty lips. And the chin point is is not tapered, it's wider. Yeah. So it's square yeah. rather than uh, rounder. And, and I think it's really important to understand that when we are injecting the chin, you've got to do it differently for a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. For a female, ideally, the width of the nose should, uh, the width of the chin should be the same as the width of the nose. So that's the width, right? Okay. With a tape, with a tapered point. Now, what doesn't look good, in my opinion, is what, well, unfortunately, I see a lot of bad genioplasties where it looks like some kind of chewing gum, big golf ball has been stuck into the chin and not blended with the rest of the jawline. That becomes glaringly obvious and it looks distorted. You can Doesn't, see it, can't you? you After can patients it. walk in, so you can see where <laughs> it is. Straight away. You can see it straight away. Um, and it's because, again, it's, it's artistry. Facial aesthetics is artistry. You need to be an artist. You need to understand the concept of blending shadows. You need to understand the concept of beautification. Not just let's stick filler in wherever we can, you know, I was told to for a woman to stick some filler into the midline. Let's give it this big pointy chin. It looks not aesthetic. It looks fake. It looks distorted. And actually it negatively impacts the way that the patient talks because this area here, the chin, has a very important muscle called the mentalis muscle. The mentalis muscle literally inserts into the lips. Okay. So if you have something that is impacting the mentalis muscle, it's going to impact the way that the lip moves. So suddenly the way that the patient smiles looks unnatural, the way that the patient speaks looks unnatural. So it's really important that you're seeing a practitioner that knows how to place filler to optimize muscle function, not reduce muscle function, yeah. particularly when it comes to the perioral area. So that you're smiling naturally, you're speaking naturally, and you don't look stiff and pulled and unnatural. When it comes to a man, the ideal width of the chin is wider. It's wider than the okay. than the width of the nose and it's squarer. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm more inclined and use filler in the chin in a man in, in a wider position and also in the jawline. Whereas in a female, I tend to avoid placing hyaluronic acid in the in the jawline because it masculinizes, it widens, it creates a heavy jaw. Um, and over time it doesn't age well. It pulls in water and it makes it look puffy. So what you can do in a female and a man is different. It's really important to to have that basic knowledge when treating uh, patients. Definitely, definitely. Are there any risks with chin augmentation? There's risks with surgical and non-surgical. There's a very important nerve that sits here in what we call the mental area, okay? okay? And this is between the lower canine and the premolar. There's a very important vascular structure and nerve structure that supplies sensation to the lip. When we are doing this procedure surgically, when we're cutting the, the or breaking the jaw to bring it forward, there's a risk of damage to the inferior dental nerve, which can result okay. in long-term or permanent numbness to the, to the lips and chin. When you're doing chin augmentation with filler, again, there is a, of course a risk, but a much, much, much lower risk of causing okay. any uh, permanent numbness because you're not severing a nerve. You can, however, place filler into or next to a blood vessel, which can okay. cause something called a vascular occlusion or a spasm, which can block the blood supply to the lips, the chin, even the tongue. Everything is connected. Remember that our face is all connected and that can result in necrosis. So again, this is why it's important to use safe techniques and potentially use ultrasound, which is a tool that we can use to assess where the blood vessels are to avoid the risk of a vascular uh, injury. And there are more and more cases coming to light of necrosis, mm -hmm. which is cell skin death, tissue death, to the floor of the mouth and the tongue when chin augmentation w goes wrong. So, you know, really important you're seeing an experienced practitioner. You can also go blind with uh, filler placed anywhere. Yeah. Chin, chin is not high risk, but there have been cases of blindness even from chin augmentation. Now, I would still say that these procedures are safe yeah. in the right hands yeah. relative to 
other procedures um, and done in the right way, placed at the right layer. When we are doing chin augmentation with dermal filler, remember that I talked about the anatomy and the bone. But the bone is one component. Mm-hmm. It's the, the skeletally, if the bone is underdeveloped, you need to place filler on top of the bone. Okay. But you also need to bear in mind how the muscle functions. So often I use a multi-layered approach using two different densities yeah. of fillers. This is one of the techniques that I've honed over years. And I find that patients who have weak chins also tend to present with cellulite on the chin or cellulite appearance. We call it, some people call it chinulite, not a very nice name, but that's what it's called. Percutaneous puckering is what it's called medically. They tend to have to force their lips closed so their lips don't naturally meet at rest because the mandible is underdeveloped. The muscle doesn't have the support that it needs so it kind of flops open and the lips don't meet at rest, which means they suffer with dry mouth, bad breath, gum disease, inflamed gums, have to constantly have water next to their bed at night. And they tend to drool at night as well when they're sleeping. And they tend to have widened masseters because they're holding tension. They're holding a lot of tension because they've been taught when they were young, close your mouth, Yeah, your mouth is open, keep your lips closed, it's rude to open your mouth. And, and they've consciously learned as a habit to overcome that open mouth, force their lips closed, but that causes tension. It's like the muscles going to the gym. It's not getting a break. It's constantly working. Mm-hmm. And the tension spreads because our okay. muscles are all interconnected. Yeah. Our blood vessels are all interconnected. When you're when you're tense all the time, you're forcing something that's not natural to mm-hmm. you. you. You grind your teeth, you clench your teeth, and you start to get widened masseters. But that causes temp- temporomandibular pain. So TMJ pain, yeah, pain in the jaw, clicking, headaches. It's all related. And then when I'm treating these patients with chin augmentation, suddenly all of those functional elements go away. They can sleep better. They can eat better. So when I'm treating the patient with chin augmentation, they're suddenly sleeping better. They no longer have the drooling at night. They're no longer grinding their teeth. The the tension is gone. It's an incredible procedure and really a life-changing procedure, not from an aesthetic point of view, from a functional point Mm -hmm. of view. From an aesthetic point of view, it's one of the most elegant understated areas to treat because if if it's done well no one knows you've had it done nobody should come to you and be like oh my god have you had chin augmentation that's the wrong kind of thing that you want to hear what you want to hear is wow you look really well but it's undetectable you leave people guessing is she was she born with it maybe she was born with it maybe stocks you know they don't know (laughs) why but that person looks better yeah, we often that's, hear that a lot, don't we? That's what they we said they look different, but they didn't know what, and I didn't tell them. Yeah. They, they they love the element of secrecy, don't they? That yeah. no no one knows. Yeah, yeah, and I get it. I get yeah. it. You know, like you you want to pretend you woke up like that. I am fully. I, I am for way. that. <laughs> that is why I am here. I'm there to empower that. Um, so I I find that to be one of the most common things I hear after chin augmentation is I'm not drooling anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer tense. My mouth isn't as dry. And I look so much better. People are commenting, I look better. I've lost weight. My double chin isn't as obvious, but no one knows what I've had done. Yeah. That's the, that's the kind of the beauty and the magic in this procedure. Definitely, it definitely is. We often see patients come and if they have sort of a weaker chin, as we say, they may need multiple mil of dermal filler, as we say. Yeah. Is there a maximum amount of dermal filler they can have? Not really. There are maximums that I would place in one go. Mm-hmm. Five mils being the maximum that I would place in one go. That sounds like a lot of products. Very rare do I do that. Only if I have a patient traveling from, you know, abroad and it's hard for them to come back. Otherwise, I like to break it down over sessions. Now, generally speaking, if you have a mild retrognathia, retrognathia means an underdeveloped chin. And an underdeveloped chin can be a horizontally underdeveloped chin. So in profile, your chin looks like it's sitting too far back. It can be a vertically underdeveloped chin, which means that it's short for the rest of the face. So the facial proportions should be that the upper face is one third of the face, the mid face is one third of the face, the lower face is one third of the face. But if the lower face is smaller, so shorter, then everything else looks bigger in the mid face, i.e. the nose looks bigger, Mm -hmm. looks off, off center, off proportion. So sometimes we need to elongate the chin. Sometimes we don't want to elongate the chin because the length is fine and we want to bring it forward. Okay. Okay. So how you approach it depends. And how much you will need depends on the presentation of the patient. It's a very bespoke treatment. So if the height of your chin is fine, but actually you've just got a very mild, horizontally underprojected chin, you might just need one mil. Yeah. If you 
have a moderate underdevelopment. So it's both short and weak horizontally. Mm -hmm. You might need more, you might need two or three mil. If it's very underdeveloped in all dimensions, then you might need five mils or more. Okay. But I like to do that over stages. So often I will do one, two or three mils in the first setting, let the patient go home, let it settle, let them get used to it, let them adapt, let the product integrate, bring them back in after two months, reassess, and if needed, tweak as needed. Yeah, no, definitely. That's... You can always put more filler in. It's a little bit more complex to put filler, take filler out. Yeah. So what I never do is fill my patients like an eclair. Yeah. We're not trying to pump up a balloon here. We're trying to create artistry mm -hmm. and blend the face in, reduce shadows, enhance features without creating disproportionate overfilled features. Yeah, no, definitely. We often talk about patients being on a treatment journey. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a process. It's, it's like going process. to the gym. After one gym session, you're not going to, you know, have, have the body that you desire. You know, it is a journey and we often talk about that with patients, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So how long do does a non-surgical um, chin augmentation last? It's the gift that keeps on giving. Okay. It lasts a really long time. We used to think in the past that fillers only last 18 months. Now we know that fillers last and last and last, sometimes even up to 10 years. So what often we see is that when we place the filler in the first instance, hyaluronic acid is water loving. So it pulls water into the area. So it's going to hydrate and it's going to expand. And that process of hydration, expansion and blending in takes somewhere between six weeks to three months to okay. reach its optimum state. Thereafter, like a sponge, hyaluronic acid loses its ability to retain water. And it, and that, and it starts to disintegrate slowly and slowly and slowly over a period of time. Usually patients may need a top up somewhere between 18 months to two years. And when I'm talking about top up, I don't mean they need all three, four, five mils yeah. again. They might just need one mil to maintain the initial result, but it's unlikely that their chin will go back to its original state immediately. Okay. It will take a long time for that unless they dissolve it. Yeah. Which is great because actually that's what you want. You want a product that sits in the tissues well, integrates well, lasts a long time, and essentially gives you more bang for your buck. Who wants to keep going back to their aesthetic doctor and having the same volume of filler placed every year? Nobody. That's 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 that in itself is an outdated, unfounded treatment journey. Nobody needs to do that. No. You need to review or go in for a review maybe once a year see how it's going. If nothing mm -hmm. is needed, go home. Yeah. If something is needed, a small tweakment to maintain your results. Yeah. So we're talking tweakments for maintenance, not a retreatment each no. time. No, definitely. And that's, yeah. we see that so much in clinic. So much. I mean, I have patients who travel in to see me from abroad, America, um, all over Europe, Australia. Um, and, and some of them only come once every four years. Yeah. And uh, when they come back, I am shocked that they still look amazing yeah. because it's just the gift that keeps on giving it lasts and lasts and lasts. Of course, there is variation. Yeah. There are some patients who are excessive runners and whose metabolism is super high and they may not retain it as much as, as others. But generally speaking, on average, I would say several years, they'll get out of it. Wow. Wow, definitely. So are there any trends and fads that you've seen regarding chin augmentation? You know, trends, always, you're always going to see trends and fads. Trends and fads come and go. And mm -hmm. I, I don't follow trends. I'm here to last and hopefully <laughs> outlast these trends. I think one of the things that I see that is really sad, actually, is when patients have had too much filler in a small area that is not blended in. Um, and it looks like it looks like this pointy thing that is stuck on and it looks very unnatural. That was a fad when, and I think still is in certain areas, where people are having six mil Kylie Jenner packages, which is please stay away from that. That is, you know, you don't need to look like Kylie Jenner or try and mutate yourself into looking like a clone of someone else. And certainly these are medical procedures that should be done only by medics, not in the hands of facialists and beauticians. That's nothing against facialists or beauticians, but you don't find doctors doing hairdressing or cutting hair or doing facials because everybody has their expertise yeah. and we're talking about procedures with risk to cause harm. And therefore it's important to understand and respect that uh, and treat patients with the care that they need. So the, this unsightly appearance, I think, not blending in the chin shadows and placing tons of filler along the jawline to try and create these Buzz Lightyear 
you know, you can razor see sharp. It from the ear, can't you? You can, can see it. It's it's really it's really not a good look. And it was at one point a fad. Yeah. You know, I used to see a lot of patients that would come in with chunks of thick, cheap filler placed along their jawline to try and give them this, you know, really sharp razor look. And first of all, it's not feminine. Second of all, it ages so badly because we are talking about blocks of blocks, you know, chunks, strands, threads of cheap filler that doesn't integrate well with the tissues, that doesn't blend well with the tissues, that sucks in lo- lots and lots of water and the patient ends up getting a really heavy jawline and it's aesthetically really not nice to look at. Mm-hmm. And they end up really upset because they go, they come in and they say, I had this because I wanted a defined jawline and now I've got this heavy jowls. It doesn't look good. So we have to dissolve it and and treat the face artistically, mm-hmm. like I say. Jo- jawline filler in a female should really be done with care, with expertise. And one of my favorite fillers to use for to enhance jawline is not hyaluronic acid, but actually calcium hydroxy appetite, which gives you that crisp definition without causing this volumization. Yeah. You don't want heavy, square, no. masculine jaw, unless that's ex- explicitly what you're asking for, but generally speaking... Um, that's not something that you want. So mm. go to someone who's artistic and who isn't afraid to say no. So what would be your take home message to our, our lovely audience watching today? I would say find a practitioner who is experienced, who is artistic, who has expertise in facial analysis and assessment, because I do stand by my statement that we can teach, I can teach most people to inject. I'm a, I'm a trainer, I'm an educator, I'm a lecturer. I've been teaching for over a decade. I can teach people to inject, but Assessing the face is a whole other skill set. Yeah. So if you just approach the face in one size fits all approach, cookie cutter approach, that's a real danger. Mm-hmm. Find someone who can create a bespoke treatment by analyzing your face and not just sticking filler in wherever they think it should go, but actually bespoking it to you. Yeah. And and go with an open mind. Often I will see patients who come in and say to me, I really hate my nose or I want big lips. And, and they're unaware of their recessive features. A good practitioner who understands facial proportion will perform a full face assessment yeah. looking at facial symmetry, facial proportions in all angles. Remember that you can only see yourself, Sophie, in a mirror or yeah. in a picture. You will never see what I see. I will never see myself the way you see me because I can only see my face in a mirror or in a picture or a video, I can't see myself 360, you know. So we're only ever looking at ourselves as a two-dimensional image of a 3D object. And because people are looking at themselves in a frontal view, they can't appreciate what they look like on a side view. And often they will not be aware that their chin is underdeveloped. So that's why it's important to to see someone who can perform that assessment and advise you so you're not having treatments you don't need. You're not having lip augmentation that will distort your features and make you look like Marge Simpson when actually your lips are fine, your nose is fine. And all that you need or that would benefit you is augmentation of the chin to place it in the right proportion. Mm -hmm. And that is called facial harmonization. Facial harmony, profile balancing is all about balance undetectable, elegant, aesthetic outcomes. Yeah. Look good, not done. Look fresh, not fake. That's my motto. That is our motto in clinic. Yeah. We want to empower people. Exactly. Empowering transformations. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Go thank you for me. coming.